Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jefferson Amstutz. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Intel. And I'm here to talk to you about SIMD and doing so in the C++ type system with SIMD wrappers in C++. Um, so just so you kind of know where I'm coming from, uh, I do come from Intel, but I'm actually a library maintainer for a, a ray tracing library called Osprey. Um, it is focused at scientific visualization, doing ray tracing at really big scales on HPC clusters. It's real fun. Um, so just know that uh, I'm trying to come from a perspective of having to use these things. Um, it's not, I don't just implement this every day. This was kind of like a side project that turned to, into something that was mildly useful um, for my own stuff. So the agenda for today is to kind of go over some uh, expectation management and an introduction, and we're going to talk about why you would care about SIMD, uh, look at what SIMD wrappers are, and then some examples of using these to um, accelerate your code. So expectations. Uh, number one is uh, uh, talking about x86 optimization is probably a multi-hour talk in and of itself. You have actually probably been to talks here at CppCon where people dive into the details of assembly code, and that's fun. It's great. Um, there's just not enough time to cover what we're going to cover today and do that. Um, it's also not a talk that we're going to that I'm going to talk a lot about specific uh, CPU. Um, uh, instruction sets, uh, so IS, ISA means instruction set architecture, and um, you know the difference between SSE, AVX, AVX2, AVX512, maybe different CPU ISAs, uh, that's an, again an entire talk in and of itself. Um, and another thing I don't want to convey is that SIMD wrappers are the only way to get uh, SIMD vector instruction generation out of your code. Uh, if you're an HPC programmer and you've already been using like pragma-based approaches, that's great, keep doing that, that's a good thing. Um, if you're using other techniques and you're happy with that, that's fine too. So this is really focused on this crowd, which would be how do I do this expressively in the type system of C++. It's also not a talk about all kinds of parallelism. So there will be a slide on this, but we're going to look at just SIMD, not threading, not multi-node, um, like networking kind of things, just SIMD. Um, and then the last piece would be uh, I did author a library called tSIMD that does this, but um, the, the point of the talk is to say, what are these kind of libraries doing? What are the kinds of problems they're trying to solve? And it's not trying to sell you, like, use my library because it's the best. Um, so some definitions before we get started. ISA, instruction set architecture. These would be the specific instructions for the CPU that you're running on. SIMD means single instruction, multiple data. So if you have a single instruction, that instruction um, normally you think of as applying to a single uh, element, like an add is two different, maybe two, two different floats. SIMD means we can do multiple floats all in that same time of that one instruction. SIMT would be single instruction, multiple threads. Uh, this will be talked about a little bit later. Um, it's a higher level concept. SPIMD, single program multiple data, uh, is actually um, something I say is equivalent to SIMT, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm going to use two different groups of terms that I hope don't get too confusing. I'll use them interchangeably because of the way my brain works. Uh, this concept of varying and uniform and vector and scalar. So uh, varying and uniform are SIMD, or, sorry, SIMT or SPIMD terms saying is this going to be like a vector's worth of values versus a uniform says always a single value. Uh, and then vector here, um, we're not talking about algebraic vectors, we're not talking about std vector, we're talking about a vector register. Uh, and scalar means not a vector register, so like a, a plain old single value. And then lastly, if I talk about like a kernel of, of code, uh, this is um, code that's going to be applied to more than one value. So you can think of it as like a function that's going to be operating on multiple pieces of data. Okay, so what kind of problems benefit from SIMD anyway? Because we need to know why we would use this at all. Um, compute intensive codes uh, that have a lot of computation to do um, are where you're going to get most of your benefit. So SIMD is less likely to help performance if you're memory bound, if you're disk I.O. bound, if you're network bound, if you're pure latency bound. Basically, if you're not bound by anything other than computation, um, it's not like you're going to get zero speed up from SIMD. It's just that optimization is a lot of factors, and this is just one of them. Okay, so I'm going to make some assumptions if you decide to go, go home and start using these libraries about when you're optimizing code. Make sure first that you're testing your code's correctness. If you go and rewrite your function into something else and you get different answers, it's not your ISA, it's your code's probably wrong. 
So you, tests are important. You're carefully measuring performance. Um, again, optimization is really hard, and it's very multifaceted no matter what hardware you're targeting. So SIMD is not always just the only answer. It's an answer and one to pay attention to, but it requires careful measurement for you to make good conclusions. And that um, there are always people out there who have uh, a very deep understanding of an instruction set and always will tell you that they can hand code something in assembly faster. Uh, and that's cool. It's just not where I think the average programmer sits. So if you're one of those kinds of programmers, that's cool. Uh, this talk's probably not for you. Okay, so let's look at uh, a little bit of background for how we are where we are and need to care about things like SIMD. So life in computing, uh, circa 2004, was a uh, life where um, CPU frequencies were just getting faster. Um, transistors were, were increasing, uh, single thread performance was going up, so uh, you've probably heard this before for the last 10 years as the free lunch, and that this free lunch is over because of power. So there was a wall that was hit where uh, by adding more transistors and trying to shove more electricity through the chip to make it clock faster, um, that that was not getting good return on in that power investment anymore. We call this the power wall. Um, so it was what we call a watershed moment because all of a sudden we went from just rely on single threaded execution to go faster for my code to now falling down a different mountain of now I need to extract parallelism because I can implement parallel constructs in hardware with a less power budget. So that's how you take advantage of more registers, or sorry, more transistors. So after 2005 and all the way up to today, um, this graph, the trends extend all the way to 2018, uh, even though that thing stops at 2015, um, is that transistors keep going up, but they're being spent on parallelism, more cores, uh, wider SIMD, uh, than on just frequency scaling. So if we just briefly look at different generations of CPUs that you can find out in the wild, the left column, there's a really old CPU um, uh, uh, at 90 nanometer, single core, nicely clocked, um, but small amounts of cache, um, not a whole lot of SIMD, uh, like 128 bit. Um, but as uh, I think in the second column, V4, that's Broadwell. Um, and you know, we go from one core to 22 cores. Uh, we go from basically no SIMD to uh, having FMA that's dual 256-bit um, uh, register oper uh, operations. And Xeon Phi made that even wider at 512-bit uh, with 68 cores. I mean, the, the, the story here is as new processors come out, parallelism becomes ever more important. And so we can visualize this. Um, here's, let's take a 12-core a, a CPU. Uh, and if you just use one, single core on that CPU to do your compute, and you have no SIMD, that's about how much of the area of the chip you're using. Um, if you then figure out how to multi-thread your application uh, and use every core, let's say all 12 cores, uh, that's about how much of the chip you're using. Then, uh, if you also can vectorize your code, um, you're gonna end up using all of the compute available. So obviously there's caches, there's uh, memory subsystems, there's other subsystems uh, that talk to the rest of the machine uh, at the edges of that chip, but there's a big difference between the far left and the far right images uh, for how much of the chip you're actually taking advantage of. Um, so parallelism comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, instruction level parallelism, threading, um, through you know, implementing those in multiple cores. So, but we're only, gonna, again, gonna focus on one, and that's vectorization. Um, so just know that there's lots of topics about parallelism, this is the one we're talking about. So data level parallelism is what SIMD really is. The idea is I can have multiple pieces of data that I compute at the same time that I could normally compute a single value. And so if we take this uh, a little loop over eight values, uh, like in an eight, uh, uh, eight length array, and I were to loop and do the same thing, uh, like this alpha times b of i plus c of i to store into a, um, that that would look something like this. You know, you would just loop and do a single value at a time. Um, and so this is what we call scalar execution. So these scalar registers only operate with single values. These are what you're used to seeing all the time. Um, but SIMD is a little bit different. Uh, in x86, we represent them with different registers. Those different registers can have different widths of values. And I know this is lots of data. Um, when we get to what SIMD wrappers are, hopefully 
this density on the slide will make a little more sense. You don't have to grok all of this right away. But the point being is these registers store more than one value, um, and that there's special instructions for manipulating these registers uh, that are not the same as scalar instructions. And so uh, SIMD parallelism in general is, is something orthogonal to threading. So threading uh, on a CPU is about what is the stream of instructions that's going to go into a core. SIMD is about, um, I guess there was a timer on that one. SIMD is about those instructions that go into the core, what are they? Are they SIMD or are they scalar instructions? So um, before we get into SIMD wrappers themselves, I just want to call out this spectrum of what SIMD versus SPIMD actually is. Um, and so on, on the left-hand side, I'll say SPIMD and SIMT is about uh, really expressing generic data parallelism that isn't specifically mapped to a particular ISA. So this would be like a logical SIMD. Like I can say um, I have a, a SIMD register of like 64 values, even though of like 64 floats, even though um, that doesn't exist in hardware anywhere today. Um, so if I want to express my parallelism generically, um, think SPIMD or SIMT, versus when you are it's specifically talking SIMD, this is very specific to a, a, the features that are in an instruction set. Um, you want very exact types to map to very specific registers because you're programming to a very particular CPU. And there's a, the different libraries that are out there are on this spectrum um, in different places. Okay, so let's look at a tour of what SIMD wrappers actually are. So there's a number that are out there in the wild. Um, so these are some of the highlights that I've picked up off of GitHub. Um, I will note in particular that VC uh, is the library that's being used to prove out the proposal to the C++ standard to get these in the, in the standard library. So if today you haven't used these at all, um, go have a look at VC. Um, that's the one that's most likely to make it into the C++ standard. But at the same time, all of these libraries are doing the same thing. I wrote TSIMD, the, one, the last one there, uh, and they're all kind of doing the same role. Um, there was one called boost.simd that uh, the numscale folks have decided to uh, pull down to rewrite to have a kind of a different feature set. Um, and then there's just ton of, tons of other ones out there that are usually embedded like in the projects that are using them. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, but uh, I think standardizing this um, in the C++ standard is a great way to fix it. Okay, so when you're looking at a SIMD library, there's some attributes that um, normally people have uh, issues with, but I think in the case of a SIMD library, uh, they're actually very good. Uh, and the, the most important one I wanted to call out is that generally these things are header only because the point of abstracting a register is for it not to have to be buried under a function call. Uh, you actually want this to be inlined and optimized um, to the nth degree. And so the SIMD library is centered around kind of three key components, and we're going to go through each of these. First is I can use a type to represent what a SIMD register is. Um, and the second is how do I get um, these kinds of types from memory into some kind of a local function space that I'm computing with um, and write them back out. And then the third would be what are functions and operators that I have to manipulate these registers. Um, so the syntax to use them looks like natural compute syntax I would use uh, with like standard scalar types. Okay, so the core abstraction I'm going to spell out, you'll find this in tsimd, but all these libraries have this same core abstraction of I have packed values that are in a register um, that represents a SIMD register's worth of these values. And that the T is the type of the element in the SIMD register. Um, so an example would be a float, could be an int, could be uh, like a char or a short. Um, the width being how big is the SIMD register. And so these two things together give me an abstraction over that, but I will note that this is a logical SIMD register. Um, this is not enforcing uh, that it is a particular ISA, or it's a type that fits to an ISA well. Um, and that's where some design, you know, low-level design trade-offs of these libraries end up. But just understand that this is how we're going to mentally say this is the core type that we're going to be manipulating. And so uh, the way we can think about these is um, kind of different methods for uh, naming these types. And we can do that with type aliases. So for instance, if I wanted to say I have a vector of floats that are four wide, I might call that vfloat4. Um, that's not the way these all are spelled. Um, 
with other libraries, but this is the way we're going to, um, I'm going to, this is the naming scheme I'm going to use for this talk. Um, so a vfloat4 would be a pack of float, it's four wide, and that would look like this, logically, that I have a register, the 32-bit floats, and I got four of them for 128 bits total. So another one might be a vint8, um, that would be this pack of 32-bit ints, that I got eight of them, and that would look like a logical register that's this big. So that's very concrete, that's, special, that's uh, specifically con, uh, concretely naming both of the template types, the, the element type and how wide it is. But there's other things we can do too. Note that there's some generic code uh, that might do uh, uh, width independent code. So I might say I need to work with a float, but I'm gonna template over how wide the register is because I, there's, I don't need to specify that much. Um, so for instance, in tSIMD, this is how we implement like different math functions like sine and cosine. Like it's the same algorithm, uh, I just don't care about how wide it is. I just need to work with registers of them. And then you can go even further and say, uh, depending on what I'm compiling for, I don't even care how wide they are. If I just say vfloat, vint, vchar, uh, I'm going to get the best, uh, the best for what I'm compiling for. And what that means can have some subtle trade-offs. So if I'm uh, compiling for AVX or AVX2, uh, my vfloat might be the exact same type as a vfloat8. It's really just manipulating type aliases to that core pack of T of W. Okay, so together we have a big old family way of, uh, of naming these types based on what our constraints are. Some are more specific than others. Okay, so I've talked about logical SIMD registers, but we still have to deal with what are we gonna actually run on. Um, and so if I have a physical SIMD register in my instruction set, um, what on earth, how do I store all these things? And so if we take an example of a 256-bit um, register uh, in AVX, um, you know, what on earth could we put in them? And the, the key point is these, in, these SIMD ISAs, um, they, when you go and look at how they're used, they're defined by the bit width of their registers, not of elements and number of elements. And so um, what you could store in this, this exact same register is a bunch of 32-bit elements, could be ints, could be floats, uh, some less, uh, less 64-bit elements, or a ton of 8-bit elements. Um, it all just depends on what the ISA supports. So for example, uh, in SSE, I can natively represent a four wide float, a four wide 32 bit int, uh, or half sized for uh, longs and doubles. Um, AVX added the ability to eight wide floats um, and four wide doubles. And AVX2 was, let's also, also do eight wide ints and longs. So note that a the first generation of AVX was just about widening floats, and then AVX2 brought in integer support as well. And then AVX512 said, let's do 16 wide for everything. Um, and as you go up in those ISAs, those CPUs can also execute the ISAs that came before them. So I can still run SSE code on a CPU that supports AVX512. All right, so hopefully you have an idea of what are like the physical constraints of the instruction set that I've got? Um, and maybe how I would logically map a type that's a pack TW to one of these registers. Um, but there's one lingering thing um, that needs some, needs some love. And that's what is vbool? So the, the, the way that you typically, or at least the way I think about it, um, is that a, a vbool is tracked for the, the size of the element that you're doing logic with uh, and the width of the number of elements that were in that register. So it doesn't closely track to the number of bits in the register, but rather what are the higher level um, elements and number of elements that I'm comparing with. So for instance, if I have two V float fours and I want to do a comparison of A less than B, um, in this view of the world, uh, you would then get a type of V bool, which is a pack of 32 bit wide bool and four. Um, conceptually, all these libraries do the same thing. The way that's spelled, whether you use a different type than pack to represent vbool, that's all there. Just understand that vbool is this about the logic of the registers you're doing, not necessarily tying to a particular register size. So I internally, mentally think that um, for like an x86-ish hint, um, that I usually mentally map vbool to a vint. Um, and just ignore the fact that it might be stored differently. So in AVX 512, um, 
All, all ICEs, all the way up to AVX 512 uh, masks, uh, these V-Bools, uh, that's another name for it, um, that these V-Bools were really just ints underneath the hood. Uh, and then on AVX 512, they turned into bits. They, we use bits instead. So we use eight bits to do eight wide float comparisons and 16 wide, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so just logic versus physical, understand that those things are lurking. Okay, so some various design trade-offs between libraries that you're going to find. Um, individual lane access. So if I have a vfloat4, uh, maybe I want to access the, the ith value out of that, just like it's a little tiny array, it's a little container, uh, which logically they all are. Just understand that, um, that that's not always something you can physically do, like that's not always, the, the a sub i is not always going to return a reference to that element because it may not even be addressable. So if we look at AVX 512 vbools, those are bits. We can't address bits in C++. So um, understand that you can do that, um, but there might be other functions that it's not spelled with the bracket operator that it uses like insert or extract to make it very explicit that you're accessing individual elements. Um, so the same thing from above might also be spelled in some SIMD library as extract i to, to get its value and then insert to set its value. So uh, another design trade-off you're going to find when you have these registers is um, do I get implicit or explicit casting between these things? And that's a very SPIMD versus SIMD trade-off. So if I have a vfloat and a vdouble, um, first, that's super ambiguous to begin with because how wide is my vfloat, how wide is my vdouble for what ISA I'm on? Depends if you're a SIMD style or a SPIMD style library. Um, but when I do some math with that, is C a double? Uh, is doing that implicit conversion a warning? Is it an error? Is this a library trying to say you're only allowed to code to a specific ISA? Or is this one that is going to try to do the best thing? Um, so remember, we have these different ways of subdividing these registers. So it's not obvious what the answer is. So when you go find one of these libraries, um, that uh, you're going you're gonna to get whether these different masking types, like if I have a mask for a 32-bit um, integer, uh, that can that cast to implicitly to a mask over the over a 32-bit float, or even different bit widths for the mask part. Uh, and, and I'll tell you in TSIMD if you go check it out that it does it does everything implicitly. Like it tries to make uh, in the above example, um, it tries to make this a V double because if those were just plain floats and doubles, it does the right thing. Um, but just know that that's not always universal, and they have good reason to choose that, like if their library is making a call about how explicit it wants you to be. Um, and another thing that can be a design trade-off that's kind of a usability thing is um, what does it mean to have a logical register that's wider than any physically sized register that you can have? So, um, for instance, if I'm on AVX or AVX2, um, what does vfloat16 mean? Is this an error or not? Uh, like in TSIMD, I think it's completely logical to treat it as two vfloat 8s. So if I do vfloat16 times vfloat16, it'll just be um, two vfloat 8s under the hood. It lets you do that. Uh, and then with AVX512, a vfloat16 is native, as you would expect. So all I'm trying to call out is sometimes uh, um, a library might say it's okay to have just purely logical registers, um, and I will try to do the right thing, versus, hey, you're trying to call out a register that doesn't exist for the CPU you're compiling for, please don't write that. Okay, so all of this up to now has been about what is this one abstraction that represents a SIMD register? This pack, uh, it's, we've got a number of elements that are of type T, that are with W, and we have aliases for talking about them, like what's vfloat versus like vfloat n or, or a vfloat 4. Um, okay, so now what can we do with these things? We haven't actually done anything with a pack yet. We've just understood what is this abstraction and how that maps to hardware. Now let's do some compute. So one very typical uh, component to a SIMD library is making the syntax of using them very natural. So think arithmetic operators. Uh, you've already seen some of that, like uh, if I have two V floats, I want to be able to add them, subtract them, multiply them, as you would expect. Um, but you can also do logical operations, like um, greater than, less than, et cetera. One thing that's really important to understand is uh, it's a design trade-off for a library to, if they provide uh, ampersand, ampersand, um, or the 
or the bar bar for ands and ors because as soon as you overload those in C++, you don't get all the shortcuts that you would expect, um, like the, e the early termination for when logical statements get evaluated. Like if I say um, false and then some expression, like that's always gonna evaluate to false and the compiler will just not evaluate the rest of the expression. Um, when you have a logical SIMD uh, VBool that you're doing um, these kinds of ands and ors with, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and so it can be a little misleading, so it's, Again, a design decision that those libraries will make, but just beware that you can still do that, but you have to do it with bitwise uh, mask operations. Um, so specifically, uh, single ampersand, single bar for ands and ors, because that's actually what the instructions are doing underneath the hood. Um, and then in core C++, uh, when you're dealing with scalar types, and in bitwise and and bitwise or, don't have those shortcut semantics. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. It's the same kind of readability of code. Um, just it's a, little, it's a little bit of a trickier thing. Okay, so we can compute these things. What about getting them in and out of memory? There's uh, a set of functions that we use to um, get values out of arrays and that they have um, different semantics, different performance trade-offs, but um, they all are trying to do the same thing. First is load. So if I have uh, some vector defined somewhere of integers, I might want to load a vint four, so four values from that, um, from like the first four values of that array, of that vector. And so what that looks like is I got values stored somewhere on the heap, and I want to load these, and now I have a local vint four that I can do all my operators and stuff with. And so store is like you'd expect, it's the same thing, but the opposite direction. I'm gonna take an entire uh, pack and stick it into wherever the destination is. And so that's great, but what if I have values that come from different places in the array? Uh, this is what gather and scatter are for. So gather um, would take, uh, I have offsets. So if I have a base pointer I'm gonna use and different um, indexes off, uh, off of that pointer, um, then I can gather values into a register. So what that looks like is um, if I have those offsets, I can go find them and bring them into one coherent SIMD register. And scatter, as you would guess, just goes the other direction. So again, I have offsets. I chose the same ones and great. Now I can have them, uh, maybe values I computed, I now need to write back into my, my data. So I have load store and gather and scatter, uh, but Sometimes I, I need to be able to write only a subset of those values. And so that's where you can introduce a mask. If I'm doing some computation, I'm like, oh, I only need like the first four values that I want to write, or the, uh, just depending on the natural logic of what I'm computing. Um, that's where you can have masked versions of all of these. So if I want to do a masked store, I might have, uh, I, I wouldn't naturally um, probably construct a mask like that. It would be the result of like, doing different comparisons in my kernel, but uh, just for demonstration's sake, let's take a mask that was on, off, off, on, and I want to do a mask store, so then what would happen is my local value when I go do that store, only the first and the last one would make it into memory. So that's my way of kind of do conditional reads and conditional writes, and you can do that for load stores, gathers, and scatters. So you get this nice matrix of, of memory I.O. functions you can work with. Okay, so there, typically these, these SIMD wrapper libraries also have additional functions that um, are accelerated for these SIMD types. Just like I can take math functions of floats um, from your standard C library uh, or through STUD for C++, uh, I can do the same thing with these SIMD types. So if I look at um, like a little distance equation here, if I had got some, some X and Y points from, from somewhere, maybe this would be in a struct instead, but um, just, just note that that's the exact same syntax that I would write it as if I just used plain floats. That's the whole point of these libraries is to make the expression there at the bottom look like a normal expression that you would use. Okay, so the last kind of piece that we'll look at uh, for what SIMD wrapper libraries provide are algorithms, and these algorithms are not the algorithms talk I'm talking about with the parallel STL. So I'm talking specifically about algorithms that uh, work with the, the values that are in a SIMD register, um, and so I'll go through a couple examples here of select, reduce, and shuffle. 
Um, this list is not complete by any means. So select says, uh, I've got two different values, and I've got some mask to say I want to blend these together. Um, some, <laughs> some libraries call it blend. Um, some call it select, where if I have a mask, two different vfloats, uh, I can get a resulting vfloat based on what those values were, uh, uh, the combination based on that mask. So if I have the same mask I used before for the, the gather and scattering, uh, if I have two A and B values, the result is they're combined, um, they're combined based on the mask. A reduce, so this is something where I want to take all the values that are in assembly register and I want to bring them down based on some operation. It could be min, max, uh, it could be a sum. Um, and these can be implemented by hand. So if you have the ability to manipulate uh, individual lanes in assembly register, you might be tempted sometimes to just write a little for loop. And that's very much missing the point. Because when you express yourself with these very specific operations, there's a chance that the ISO that you're compiling for might have an instruction for it. When there's an instruction for it, you want to use that instruction. That'll be the fastest implementation. So um, I'll just implore you to understand that if you want to do an inter-register operation, look for an algorithm first. If it's not uh, there, then maybe write the, the scalar loop over the SIMD register. But, um, and then for masked, we have some custom reductions. So I want to be able to say, like, are all of these true? Are, are any of these true? Are none of them true? Um, so if I have that mask, you know, any is true because some of them have, have, are, are, are true, um, but all and none are both false. All right, the, this last one, shuffles and swizzles, um, they can get really complicated. The, the whole concept is if I have a, a register of values, I want to be able to rearrange them. And sometimes that's compile time, uh, destinations, and source and destinations. Sometimes it's runtime. Um, just understand it's really complicated and I'll implore you to go do more research about where I would want to use these. Um, but just understand that that's the fundamental thing that you're doing with a shuffle swizzle is taking a register and generating an output register based on rearranging the elements. All right. So now we've got a, hopefully a good idea of what SIMD wrappers are. It's a core abstraction, a pack of TW, and I can manipulate those things. I can get, I can uh, pull them in from memory, and I can store them. But um, I wanted to call out a, a very typical usage model of SIMD in general, but a SIMD library, they, those, those groups of functions that you're going to use to manipulate these are arranged for a reason. It's because typically you want to load values from, that you have in memory. You want to do some compute, and you want to store them. So uh, you'll notice there are functions that load values from memory. Um, there, you have your ways of manipulating registers with operators and functions to do whatever algorithm you're implementing, and then you want to store them back. Um, and so, uh, as, a, as an entire high-level uh, high view of what we're trying to do is really this. So I have some examples. Um, I have example code that's up on GitHub. Um, you can download it, run it, it's fun. Uh, I will switch to that for live demo. Okay, so uh, SACSP is this like hello world of parallel computing that you might recognize is all over the place. And the whole concept is, is forgive the primitive types, it's just less visual noise. Um, I'm not advocating this for uh, modern C++ production code, but just understand if I have some value uh, and I want to uh, take that value, multiply it by the element in the first array, uh, and then add it to the element in the second array and store it in some result, in some output, that's called SACSP. Um, so the sum of AX plus Y, that's what the acronym means. So little for loop, you got my little, my little formula, I'm gonna write it to the output array there at the end. Um, I have some comparisons like what OpenMP is, so uh, if you don't know what OpenMP is, uh, I'd encourage you to go Google it. Um, it's, it's the whole annotation via um, pragmas to say, hey, compiler, you can probably vectorize this loop even if you're really paranoid that you might do something wrong. Um, so I put that in there for comparison's sake. Um, and then there's tsmd, this is a tsmd example. Um, note that the syntax here, like, if I take um, x sub i, I'm loading a v floats worth of, from x sub i. Um, I, so I load two different values, do the normal expression, I have a result, then I store the result. Uh, and the key is that then this, um, this for loop is now 
Um, the width of the VFlow, less number of iterations. So you, uh, instead of doing, let's say, uh, 64 iterations, I can now do this in eight iterations, less, run, less code executed, that's a lot faster. Um, and so I use Google Benchmark um, to benchmark these things. So let's just have a little quick look. If I run Saxby, this is with GCC here on my Mac locally. Um, you can see that, hey, uh, the scalar version was pretty fast. That is really tiny, isn't it? Did not think about that. Um, okay. All right, so hopefully that's a little easier to see. Um, it, the speed up is not as you'd expect. Note that optimization's hard. It's really, really rare that your, your entire compute problem is going to be that simple. So we're probably hitting things like some memory bandwidth issues, uh, uh, just pipelining stuff, just things to go crazy with investigating. Um, so that's, that's Saxby. If you want to go look at that offline, that's fun. Um, but I did something else. I, I, I noticed, like, what, what could I use as a simple proxy for a much more computationally expensive code? Because Saxby's nice because it's simple, and you could plug that into Godbolt and be like, look, I got vector instructions, but that's not the whole story. Um, so what I wanted to create was a version of doing Saxby, but it's, like, a lot more complicated. Um, so instead, what I did is create what I call Saxby trig, which is, this looks kind of like Saxby, but I injected this arbitrary number of um, calls to trigonometric functions, which are expensive. Um, so, uh, you know, A times sine of X plus cosine of Y, and take the tangent of that, and then uh, you can definitely play with um, injecting arbitrary additional calls to tangent. Um, so it, what it does is it, it's, we're simulating, like, I got a lot of computation to do, um, even though that would be numerically nonsense, um, Saxby's nonsense as well. So, um, uh, but then also at the end, I injected something else, which is like a conditional, I'm only gonna write it to memory if some condition's tr true. Um, so as you'd expect, OpenMP is, put the pragma there, great. Um, TSIMD is hopefully not onerously more complicated. Um, being able to load a value from memory, uh, load another value from memory, and hey, look, I just call sine and cosine on them. It's not complicated. I call, I call tangent. Hey, look, this is the exact same loop as above with a different namespace. Um, and then, uh, you know, I can create a little mask, which is, hey, should I write the result out? And if any of those are true, I'm going to do a, a, a store. So basically, if they're all false, nothing happens. Um, and if, uh, this store is a mask store. So if I just had, if I just had that, that would always store all the values, and that's not what we want. Instead, we want to say um, only the values that are true in that mask. We're going to store those out. So we have Saxby trig. There we go. So we, I did a couple of things here. Uh, I decided to benchmark std sine, cosine, and tangent. I benchmarked uh, the TSIMD sine, cosine, and tangent. They use different algorithms fundamentally, so they do take different amounts of time. Because um, if you're only on scalar values, there's probably certain optimizations you can do um, that are hand done inside the C standard library. Um, but note, note the scalability difference here. Once we actually do the SACSP um, trig calculation, uh, OpenMP, got really paranoid and said, ah, I see trigonometric functions, I just can't vectorize that. Um, I will tell you that if you are using OpenMP with the Intel compiler, um, Intel does ship a vectorized math library, so that's not always true. If you don't have that compiler on this machine, so we just won't worry about that. But note that I didn't need that uh, with SIMD wrappers because my SIMD wrapper library supp uh, supplied those trigonometric functions. Um, so the difference in and execution time between the scalar and TSIMD version is dramatic. And it actually gets better if I come in here and say, well, let's, uh, let's quadruple the number of times we just call those additional tangents. So instead of doing 10 extra calls to tangent, let's do, um, let's do 40. So yes, all those should be the same. Now we're going a lot slower because we're just tangent all over the place. And Great. On, on this AVX2 CPU on here, 
got a Skylake CPU in this Mac. Um, I'm getting somewhere to seven ish X, seven to eight X speed up, do the math. You can see it for yourself. Um, that's the whole point. The whole point is I'm doing a lot of computation and it scales a lot better uh, with my SIMD width. Okay. So let's go back to the presentation. All right, so we've got Saxby, Saxby Trig. I forgot to show you Mandelbrot. Uh, we can get that at the end. Um, it's a little more complicated, but I just wanted to make sure I get through the rest of this content, and then we can go back to Mandelbrot. And that is, I wanted to talk about data layouts. So um, it's great when you have contrived examples of like, I have a pure float array, and I have a, um, a pure integer array, and that's nice, but I do more complicated things. So in the world of ray tracing, we deal with algebraic vectors all the time. So this is like your x, y, z vector. You can do dot products and all kinds of things with. Um, and so typically, you would write this like this, or even write it um, like as a raw vec3f would just be a float x, y, z. Um, but for um, the sake of configuring different types for what your elements are, um, we're going we're gonna to template it over what the element is. And so there's different kinds of data layouts that you can, uh, that are general high-level strategies. I'm going to introduce those and then talk about how we would instantiate these kinds of, um, these kinds of templates to, to do more complicated data structures. So the first is array of structures. Um, this is what you're used to seeing. This would be um, if I have an, a float x, y, z. Um, that means if I have an array of those, we'll call that vec3f, um, then that would just be an array of those structures, array of structures. Um, the other is you can invert that and say, I want um, an x, y, z vector where the, that algebraic vector type is the entire data set that I have, like a whole array of x's, a whole array of y, a whole array of z's. This is what we call a structure of arrays. Um, and in another talk, maybe in the future, uh, I could talk about um, strategies for like how you want to really tune data layout for performance, but that'd be a different talk. Um, and then the third category is what we call an array of structures of arrays. Um, and we'll visualize this in a sec, but the concept is if, if I have a, like a V float eight for my element, so and my X is a V float eight, my Y is a V float eight, my Z is a V float eight, um, and I take an array of those, I would have an array of, um, I'll call vector or varying vec3fs. Uh, we'll visualize this in a sec. Um, that's an array of these little tiny structures of arrays. So hopefully that didn't lose you. But uh, let's look at this data layout of this structure. And for the sake of visualization, we're going to actually orient these differently. So this means um, if, if I have a, what we call a uniform version, so I just have scalar types instantiating with, um, I'll call this a uniform just plain vec3f. Um, here's some type aliases. Just like we can talk about SIMD registers, we can talk about algebraic vectors in the same kind of language. Like if I have a vec3f, a vec3i, I have xyz for, for ints, for longs, whatever you want. Um, and you know, usually like a, a vector type, you still can do math with operators and stuff. So the, the last line is saying, hey, you can add two vec3s together and maybe subtract a scalar from it. That's fine. The point is, in memory, I have one float or one int. Uh, so one element, one element, one element. So then vfloat. Like, where do I get to use my fancy SIMD wrapper? And remember that uh, these operators operate per lane. So they would do, like, if I'm doing a vfloat plus a vfloat, it's going to add up um, the, the first element in each one, the second, third, um, to generate a third, to generate an output register, an output pack. So you have all of these available to you, which look remarkably like what plain floats look like. So it turns out, if I want a varying vec3f, I'll just stick a v float in there. If I want a varying vec3i, I'll just stick a v int in there. So what I can do is, uh, with like if I have a, a vec, uh, a float four, so a, a v float four. Um, a varying vec3f4, that's a bit of a mouthful, where I would have x is four values stored as a SIMD register, y is four values stored as a SIMD register, and same for z. So hopefully you can see this composition because I've, because with a SIMD wrapper you model um, like, a, like a varying float, a vector of floats, the same way you would treat a normal float, these kinds of um, data structure manipulations then become a lot more natural and easy. 
Okay. So if we were to look at SOA, the structure of arrays version, um, instead we would just instantiate like a vector of floats, uh, like a std vector of floats. Um, so I created some aliases here to say, hey, um, I'm going to say my stream type. Um, like if I have a stream of floats, I'm just going to call that a std vector. Um, and so my s float instead of a v float, my stream float um, is basically ends up being a std vector of float. And so my stream of vect3fs um, or my SOAs of vect3f, whatever terminology you want to use is fine. Um, now I have vect of s float. Uh, and so then that means, let's say I had 64 of these values, I would have 64 x's, 64 y's, 64 z's. Um, I would like to point out this is called horizontal vectorization and I'm using my definition of that um, because if you look at it logically, I hope, I hope you can gather that when we go from this to this, we're horizontally making it wider. Um, the problem is, I was at SIGGRAPH and talking with, with someone about this, and the terminology is confusing, confusing if you look at it in memory uh, for what's considered horizontal versus uh, um, which, which is vertical because those would actually be concatenated in memory. They're not, yeah, anyway. The entire point is um, keeping this at a logical, like what I'm widening point of view, I think is a way to stay sane, but that's just personal opinion. And so, what you'll find in like the games industry um, in particular who are operating on maybe less items of data and they're still trying to get speed up from SIMD, uh, you'll find that they can only use SSE pretty often because if I've got um, a single uh, uniform VEC3F and I want to do um, SIMD on it, maybe I have to um, use SSE, which would be four wide floats. Um, so maybe I can do uh, like a reduction or something on that, uh, on that VEC3F with SIMD, but then that doesn't scale like AVX is eight wide. Um, I don't get any better. AVX 512 gets even worse. So vertical vectorization is where you're trying to take a single scalar structure and do SIMD in between those values. This is a lot trickier. It's a lot, it's still useful, but it's just a lot more, uh, it's a lot harder to do. Um, and so, um, I'll just, I'll say my, my recommendation is to always consider horizontal vectorization where possible because this you can keep in your head with like, if I were to do that vvec3f expression at the bottom of that a plus b minus one, I can in my head understand that like, okay, I'm gonna get a vector add between um, a and b and I'm gonna create like a, a, a vector of full of one and then take the result of that and do the subtraction. Like there's, I can reason about what's going to be vectorized and it's, it's, it might take a little bit to sink in, but it's a lot easier to reason about when you use the strategy versus this. You, you're on wider ices and you don't get a whole lot of speed up. Um, so it really depends on your problem. It's really what I'm trying to say. Okay, so this, this concept of data layout, it can compose. So if I have a VEC3T, remember I can make a VEC3F and a varying VEC3F. Um, if I have a ray, I'm a ray tracing guy, so I gotta show you some rays. Um, uh, if I have a ray, which is an origin and a direction, I can actually create two different types of rays. I can create a uniform ray, which would be, I want my ray T to be a single float, or maybe I want a varying ray of width four, um, which would just, I would stick in V float four instead. Because I have VEC three T, that template that, ex, ex, that completely takes care of the problem of the algebraic vector, I can now instantiate very different data layouts with little aliases. Um, and I may, depending on uh, what I'm writing, have different transformations for like, can I, in that varying ray, can I go grab like the ith offset in that ray so it gets the ith vec3 origin, the ith vec3 direction, blah, 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 blah. There's really cool things you can do. Don't have a lot of time to show you all that stuff. So. Um, the advice I want to give you is just consider horizontal vectorization first. You know, where can I, instead of using a plain float, just use a varying float. Like is that, can that really just solve my problem? Whether I want to stick it in my data structures uh, like I showed you and just use varying float as if it were a float, or if I need to do um, like load, the whole load compute store thing, both of those end up being um, hopefully straightforward, more straightforward to do with horizontal first. Um, and so there's some reasons to, that you get some benefits for horizontal vectorization. One being scalability. So if I'm, if I'm doing like a particle simulation or something and I'm working on four particles at a time or eight or 16, the point is, is like that's a changeable value. 
And so if my ISA keeps getting wider, uh, I can basically keep scaling and I didn't have to re really rewrite anything. The second is portability. So the, this, is, um, this is about ISAs that may or may not map to your problem. So with vertical vectorization, you know, if, my, if I have an XYZ type and they're all floats, there's all, there's, ABX 512 is not going to do a ton for me. Um, so I can better use the, these different ISAs, even across different, this isn't even limited to x86. This is true for ARM and, and other CPUs uh, architectures. And then the last is clarity. So if you want to look at what, what is going to be vectorized when I use these data structures, it's a lot easier to understand if, like I have a, a four wide ray and I'm going to generate an output uh, of like four pixel colors. Like that's then a lot more obvious for how, what code gen I'm gonna get instead of um, writing, you know, deep function call lists and then what my data layout and vectorization code gen looks like is, is then not obvious. Um, so three reasons to, to choose horizontal vectorization first. Um, so then there's this, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room, but I'll call it the elephant in the room, is what about GPUs? Um, and the, the, the thing I want to communicate is um, SPMD versus SIMD, or uh, SPMD, SIMD versus SIMD. Um, when, you're really tar when you're really optimizing for a particular instruction set, you then start really focusing on like, I need vFloat 4, and that's all the, thing, the only thing I care about, or I need vFloat 16, the only thing I care about. If you can write your algorithms with just vFloat, just the concept of a varying float, uh, it turns out when you then go to a GPU and you might have super wide SPMD, um, like NVIDIA, AMD GPUs, whether you're in Sickle or whatever, um, uh, or in CUDA, the idea is I have these configurable widths. In my algorithm, I've expressed what are the data types that are wide and which ones are uniform that are going to stay small. Um, so these types of techniques that I was showing you with that VEC3F um, and the varying VEC3F, then hopefully translate to, cool, I can instantiate the right types that'll be the right layout for my GPU kernels. Again, something don't have enough time to, to talk to you about. Um, and so uh, I, there's another talk from CPPCon two years ago that I want um, everyone to go take a look at if you haven't yet. Um, Nicolas Guillermo, uh, he did a talk on pure SPMD in C++. He came up with this cool little way of doing mask management and stuff. And, um, that's a whole other talk in and of itself, which was done, so you should go take a look. And um, I, another thing to think about with SPMD, SIMT, um, GPU computing, is that SIMD really is, like, has its strictest definition, where I really care about these register sizes and, and what operations I can do on them. You can think of SIMD as an implementation detail of SPMD. So when I'm using my SIMD wrapper libraries to you know, take advantage of ABX2, I might be thinking in a SPMD type of like, I don't really care what the width is, but eventually when I compile my code, I know what SIMD instructions I'm gonna get. Um, I know it's pretty dense to kind of reason about, but uh, I'm trying to give you information to go maybe um, help yourself on Google or come talk to me afterwards. And so the last thing is at the end of the day, we're talking about parallelism. And the way you schedule kernels that you write with these types, um, I, hope, I hope I don't get too much flack for this, but I'm convinced that the core kernels that you write, um, they are not actually that tied to the architecture. It's just how do you schedule like a zillion threads on a GPU versus like a bunch of tasks on a CPU that I think the core kernels themselves um, can actually remain the same. So hopefully, whether you're coming from GPU computing and you're trying to be like, how do I do SPMD or SIMD on CPUs, or if you know, that's where you're coming from and you wanna go learn GPU computing, the, the high level concepts are not all that different. At the, at, at the end of the day, we're trying to say, here's some math where I, can do, I know I can do multiple of these values um, at the same time, and once you have that core concept, well, how you spell it in CUDA or Sickle or ISPC or in C++ ends up being more inconsequential. So I think I'd like to have some time open for questions. So that's my talk. Uh, can you please go back to the call example? I want to make yeah. sure I understood something. Yeah, I, I went through this pretty quick. 
So the the Saxby or the trig the Saxby trig one. Uh, Either. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. So just wonder what are the uh, best practices in case the uh, static size of the register is not a multiply of the vector. So, so you have like. So th this this is what I'll call a, a SPMD SIMD trade off. Um, a SIMD style, a more SIMD type uh, implementation decision would be you only get the, the possible candidates that can be instantiated. Like it can be, like with my library, it's you can choose one, four, eight, or 16. That's it. So you might have to do a little logic to say if, if my array, um, yeah, like it should also be like um, in this one. Yeah, exactly. It should be good catch. And um, I is less than uh, n, then so then we won't write it if we're beyond the array. So those elements that by adding by adding this right here, that was a really poor use of a. There we go. So this part of the expression, we can also say okay if the result is in my range that I care about fine, but also it has to be less than the number of elements. Plus, yep, sorry, I plus size. I plus, um, good pair programming there. Um, so does that make sense? Like, it'd just be a part of my mask that I use to say what I write to memory or not. Because I don't, if there, there's no time saved by like, like when I compute a, like a vfloat math, the fact that I'm gonna ignore some at the end won't make any of the instructions go faster. So it kind of doesn't matter if I have only five that I care about, um, and I'm only going to write five, but I have eight that I'm totally doing. A vector instruction is a vector instruction, um, so you won't save time by like trying to mask the math itself. You only need to mask the write to memory. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Hi, I have Hi. two questions. Yep. So first question is, uh, what's your opinion of suitable applications for SIMD. Mm -hmm. For example, I have I can think of examples that's harder to express in this library. For example, you have multiple keys. You want to look up those keys in a map at the same time. It looks really hard to express in the library. Uh, so if you want to look up values like in a table? In a map. like Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things. One is you're probably going to have to implement a custom map that is friendlier in its data layout. So maybe you'll store vectors of keys, and then you'll fill those piecemeal as you start setting values, and then you can look up keys faster that way. Um, or you're going to have to do lots of gathers that may, it, it's all specifically the application you're doing. You would have to write a map that is stored more SIMD friendly. So probably std map would not be your friend. Yeah, that's what we'll need a, the change of the library, which is not always doable, right? Yeah, well, it, it ends up being very specific to what you're doing. Yeah. You know, not there won't be a one size fits all container that fits all all usages of a, a map. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, since we need to lay out the data correctly uh -huh. first to use the library, will that uh, make the data structure less straightforward to understand? So that's where I think the type aliases help. So instead of saying, instead of sprinkling in vec. 3t of v float everywhere in your code, give it a name, v vec 3f, a varying vec 3f, and then use that instead. So it, it kind of hides that uh, you don't need to use the template instantiation everywhere. Um, you can talk to me afterwards, I can show you code. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can you go back to slide 90? Yeah. And I think possible they're out of sync from the, oh yeah, that is it, great, okay, cool. So, uh, can you real quickly explain again why those two operators are not implementable? So, so they are implementable, they just then kind of lie to you. So if I say like, um, if I say one, one expression and another expression, um, if it's just plain scalar math, like your normal, like normal Boolean math, um, if that first expression is false, the second one will never be evaluated. Right. However, um, in C++, when you overload those operators, it's function call. Yeah, it ends up being a function call and doesn't go away. So then people will will think, oh yeah, this will shortcut and it won't execute, and then it's not true. And underneath the hood, when you do SIMD um, 
uh, logical operators like that, they end up being bitwise anyway. So then that's why the suggestion is to instead use these. So when you're calling those, is it doing a bitwise for each individual element? Yeah. So it's not uh, reducing those. It's in not the a, so a reduction would be different. Okay. So my understanding was that the prior to the doubles could be implemented as an operator pool for each of the operands, right? But if it's by if it's, if it's not being reduced to one value, correct? Then, okay, that's the difference. So yeah, I could do like an any of some expression and any of some expression that turns those into single pools, and then that does like what you expect. Yeah. So that is. Yeah. That is valid for what Yeah, so if I reduce those those V bools down to a single regular C pool, then then yeah, I mean those and 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 or were still back on the table. And would that behavior match what you're looking for? Or? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, can we use um, scatter and gather with iterators? Like if the data is not That could be a really interesting iterator implementation. Like, um, yeah, that, that, so you have like, like a, you have like a, list. yeah, like a ver well, yeah. So you have like a varying iterator and then you can conditionally increment it um, and then you end up having offsets or elements that you're pointing to and then, and then when you write like a V float to yeah, it. My then, iterator is continuous, like I'm using a map and okay. for every element of the map I want to do something. Uh -huh. So I want to load like four elements together using an iterator and then do the operation and then store it back. But it may not be contiguous in the memory. Yeah, so I, I, I think you'd have to write a custom iterator for that, and then you could just say on assignment, if they're not contiguous, or just always scatter. Because you can, because technically I can scatter to contiguous offsets. You just might not get the most efficient instruction, but um, yeah, that's it's totally a, a cool pattern. Like a SIMD iterator, yeah. At some point, you presented reduce uh, as a function. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, pick up this slide again. Um, that would be way down here. I mean, like min max and stuff like that. These guys. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is: uh, Is reduce some something that can actually be uh, vectorizable, and eventually how? So there, um, it, it's, it not, it's not that you, you vectorize the reduce. So remember, these algorithms are only on the elements in a register. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is different from like a std reduce of like a big container. So like a tsimd reduce is like, I'm just going to do the reductions in a simd register to like a single value, like a sum or a max or something like that. That could be used to speed up an implementation of like std reduce on like a std vector to do it in less number of iterations. Right, and what I was referring to is like the only way I can imagine this implementation can be is like actually normal sums of, uh, let's say we, you, we have a vector of four uh, floats. Mm -hmm. I can imagine only like four sums. Correct, the, correct. That's the only, so I don't see like any um, any other way to implement it with, with SIMDs and I was wondering if there's gonna be any. So on there. most architectures, things like, like min max and some they're actually just intrinsics you, you, uh, yeah for yeah. min max of course no i'm talking yeah. about some yeah and and so if, this is something if you have a more if you have a more complicated reduction yeah you're gonna have to write a for loop which hopefully you wrap in your own little function but right. yeah that's what you got okay thank you yep any other questions all right thanks for coming <laughs>